Hey gang, welcome back. <coughs> Excuse me. So I thought we'd have a little look at Pacific Islands campaign Guam. And uh, this is a Golden Knight Simulations game. It's uh, designed by Chris Fasulo. And it's a battalion level game with company and platoon breakdowns. So you can see these stacks here. This is a battalion of units. And this is this guy. And the system is fairly straightforward. Part of it can be explained by, quite simply, by just sharing with you a little bit of information about the counters, which I did touch on in another video when I was trying to work out how I was going to manage the counters because the counters on the back are blank. So, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, the bottom right hand side uh, here is your movement rate and the left and right numbers there are your range uh, for uh, close range and uh, long range shooting and they're the fire powers um, is that right? I think it is five and three and now I'm gonna have to check because uh, it's been five minutes since I've looked at the rules yeah, close range and long range, that's right. And the last number is the defense strength. So, what does that tell you? It tells you a couple of things. It tells you, first of all, that we have ranged combat with uh, company-sized units that are played out on one kilometer hexes. And it says that each unit, each uh, company, is worth about um, 200 guys and which will translate into basically 200 victory points because in the campaign game you can't lose more than 10,000 troops as the US and I think historically they lost uh, 8,000 or 4,000 or something like that maybe it was 6,800 I, I, I forget it's in here it's here in the notes so this game is set with the view that we are trying to uh, experience and explore how the Army and the Marines conducted their landing operations and how they executed the campaign on this island, which when, if you look at it, it's only at its narrowest point, which I think is here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven kilometers across. Uh, it does obviously stretch out to be a little bit wider up at that end and certainly down here. It's got a mix of terrain on it. And what I thought we'd do here is really kind of have they have the beginnings of a look at the strategy for the game and see if we can't come up with some plans and ideas for both sides and then assess how that might be applied in the game when we look at the game mechanics. Um, so the, the battle for Guam was uh, particularly bloody. It was uh, pretty intense fighting and the, uh, it took, uh, there were 8,000 Japanese soldiers killed after the battle ended here. So after the, the place was deemed to be in control of the 20,000 troops, the Japanese troops that were on the island, 8,500 survived and hid in the, the, the woods, the forests and mountains and hills here and fought on and uh, conducted basically guerrilla operations for an extended period of time. This game doesn't cover that. This game only covers the 21 July through 10 August 1944 uh, events. So it's the uh, in actual invasion of Guam, Operation Forager. So what is it? It tells us a few things about the game, right? But the the one of the things that I'm going to be curious about there's this concept in here in the rules of this seven battlefield operating systems and how they work together to bring out the the mil the actual way in which military operations are conducted. Uh, Chris is a former. Whether he's a combat veteran or just in the military, I don't know specifically, but we can certainly look into that and comment on it later. Uh, but he goes over the, the, the systems from his viewpoint and from his learnings are maneuver, fire support, intelligence, combat service support, mobility, survivability, air defense, and command and control. And so he takes the rules and really structures the rules around that, those concepts, which is all fine and good. Uh, 
very straightforward sequence of play. You can see it here. You got your moving, you got your replacements, landings, landings fire assault phase, movement phase, uh, defensive fire gets to occur, air ground attack phases, combat phases, and then uh, the suppression recovery for the US and the Japanese player goes through a very similar cycle, right? So it's pretty straightforward sequence of play. And when I looked at the rules, I filled three post-it notes with uh, summarized rule comments. So fairly straightforward. The trick will be to see how, how these landings work, you know, how we take into account shore batteries, how we take into account uh, the ships that were uh, providing offshore bombardment, how air plays into this game, and <clears throat> and how the combat, this ranged combat, will work. Really, the ranges are you know, one or two hexes, typically, so I can certainly see that it's viable for us to say that a company of men are all shooting from you know, up to a kilometer in distance as an engagement range, you know, particularly with modern weapons. Clearly, clearly, most combat is going to occur, most deadly combat anyway, will occur in that uh, closer range, so adjacent, in adjacent hexes, and that'll be the you know, assault style combat. So, so that's what I, I, that, this game we want to look and I'm looking to see how that's all going to come together, how we will be able to apply some of these principles that Chris has written about, and when, whether or not this feels like a Pacific theater uh, title. Uh, <clears throat> the I've already spoken about the, the counters and the maps and the artwork and the rule book and the charts. I think generally speaking, excuse me, generally speaking, everything is uh, uh, pretty good quality for what you're paying. And uh, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how this plays out. I imagine, you know, I'm going to play, we'll do the landings and then we'll play three or four turns to get a feel for it. That we might reset or we might just carry on through depending on what happens. So strategy. As, as the Japanese player, because we haven't really goofed around with breaking these individual uh, battalions down into their discrete components, uh, you can stack them all up here uh, and then you're allowed to break them down at some point in the play cycle. Uh, and I've got some forces I need to allocate, but we've got to look at <clears throat> what do we want to try to achieve, and that's going to drive us back to the victory condition. So the first thing we want to do that we know, uh, that I've shared with you so far, is we want to inflict a lot of casualties, which means we're going to need to make the attacker fight a set uh, disadvantageous, dis disadvantageous odds, and also provide ourselves with the ability to counterattack. The other way in which we can secure victory as the Japanese in one way or another is to uh, maintain some level of control over the island. And that's where the victory conditions get a little mushy because it says that you, the US you know, wins a massive victory or whatever the case may be if you have less than 10,000 casualties and you have control of the island. And it doesn't really define that, and it's probably here, I just haven't seen it. Uh, it doesn't really define so far that I've seen what control means. Uh, so clearly, given that there's a number of villages and uh, named locations, I, mean, I would imagine, that, and an airfield, I would imagine that at the very least to control this island, we would need to control the airfield. We would need to control the major population centers. Okay, there are several of them. And we will probably need to control either the high ground, right? Or at least have the, the Japanese forces in such a, uh, in a pos such a position that they're isolated from those control points uh, and are, no, are effectively no combat danger. That's kind of how I'm looking at it. I don't see anything in the victory conditions here that really tell me exactly what control means. Uh, let me just see real quick here. I think it was VPs, VPCs somewhere. Excuse me. 
Yeah, the game is either won or lost based on how much time it takes. So there's a time factor as well. The U.S. to recapture the island and how many casualties. And uh, clearly, as you all may know, the Guam Island was deemed important because it was uh, going to be a staging place for bombers to hit other islands along the the chain of islands towards Japan and indeed allow the B-29s to bomb Japan directly themselves. So fairly strategic uh, according to the, the military histories that have been written so far. I'm sure there's some opposing opinions on that. Okay, let's see. We do receive negative uh, movements down the success chain if we uh, take too many replacements. Uh, but it says a decisive uh, U.S. victory is a, uh, occurs when you occupy and secure the island by the 10th of August or earlier. And it goes through that exercise all the way down to a decisive Japanese victory, which allows the U.S. player to occupy and secure the island no earlier than the 19th of August. But nowhere does it define what occupy and secure means. So that poses a little problem to, to get started with, but I don't think it's some, it's one that's insurmountable by any any means. And I think we'll probably use that that uh, that uh, thinking that I previously shared with you. So as the Japanese, whew, you look at this. This is a hodgepodge of stuff. I've got to I've got to allocate these engineering units and uh, AA and uh, anti tank units, and they're important too because. The guns and uh, uh, engineers provide combat bonuses, but uh, DR DRMs, for both defender and attacker. So it's going to be important to uh, have these type of units available uh, to some of these you know, major forces. So here, for instance, I've got one, two, I've got two battalions. See, this act, this stack actually starts out overstacked. You can have nine. I want to say nine companies. Is it nine companies in one hex? Let me just check that. Or well, maybe it's two battalions. I forget now. No, it's three battalions. So it's not overstacked. So there's two battalions and then that's one, two, three companies. So three platoons. So barely, barely overstacked. Barely, uh, very close to being overstacked. So Lots of units can go into one hex, which means we can end up with very large stacks. All right, excuse me. So I'm looking at this map with this with these these landings here. They're running right into the gauntlet, but the good news is the chaps in the mountains are not in range to shoot down onto the beach. So this would be a beach, uh, these are beach landings here. Uh, a lagoon, I think that's lagoon terrain. Where is it here? Yeah. All this light blue is lagoon all along here. So this is all lagoon landing. And what happens when you cross this little reef, and if you can see that reef line there. You know, when you move, you move the guys in here and then uh, they get to here and uh, they kind of have to spend, uh, I think, a full turn here and then move, or move when they get to here, they can move half movement. We'll get into the det details of that. Uh, I haven't printed off my summary of the rules yet. So, anyway, so this is going to be challenging. And I also think that uh, at some point, and I know this is taking a long time, so we're probably going to skip out in just a second and the other landing is going to be here which one drops right into a village but the rest is in open clear terrain uh, with a nice little mountain range here to uh, to really pound on these guys in fact one two they're going to be right in range long range fire so that could be pretty deadly so we'll see what happens um, clearly the Japanese are going to have to keep a reserve force available to conduct some counterattacks most of these infantry units, you can see, can move fairly far. These guys have a, a movement rate of 10. You see that there? 
Uh, Ahama has a move rate of 20. That's a, bu that's a bunch uh, when you look at the size of the size of the island. Anyway, thought I'd share that with you. Let's wrap this up. That's way, whew, 15 minutes, probably 15 minutes too long. We'll talk to you soon.